recording. Okay, so this will be part two of Mayor. Welcome to EDAP 690, the class that Mayor built. We will now do part two. And I, what I want to do with this is I want to do a little bit of review, make sure we understand what Mayor's cognitive theory is all about. Because once we understand that, then the part where we actually look at its 12 principles, it all kind of fits together. So let me jump in here and let's go look at that real quickly right here. And let's look at this wonderful graphic. Um, so I, what you, I know I, I spend a lot of time on this and what I'm trying to get you to see is that number one, this is the basis. This is the reason why he created the 12 principles. Um, and as I've said before to you, in the in the literature, you'll you'll hear people or you'll hear. <laughs> you'll read people talking about things like PowerPoints, blah, 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 blah. Well, yeah, but really in the newer uh, versions, editions of his book, he tries to downplay that and comes back to this more and more. And I'll show you what I mean, especially the modality principle. He really, I think, gets the ideas that people like Gar Reynolds have put out there about presentations and the right way and the wrong way of doing them. But let me look at this with you for a second. So when you go back and you do the, the reading, cognitive theory, what Mayer does is he basically comes out with the idea that there are two separate channels, auditory and visual, that uh, are how we receive information, dual channel. But the problem is that each one of these channels has a limited finite capacity that Mayer pays homage to a guy by the name of Sweller, S-W-E-L-L-E-R, who is the person who came up originally with this idea of cognitive load. In other words, you can only hold so much in your head uh, as you're learning. And that learning is the active process of filtering, selecting, organizing, integrating information based upon prior knowledge. That is probably the most important thing for you to understand about how we learn from multimedia. I'm going to read it one more time. So this whole process that is in front of you, this is an active process of filtering, selecting, organizing, and integrating information based upon underline, underline, underline prior knowledge. So when you look at this and then you wonder why kids don't get it, um, yeah, we could speak to mayor's principles, but also what we need to realize is if this holds up, this model is real, then we need to realize there's an awful lot of area in here for failure, for failure of learning. I talked about last week that human beings um, have about six seconds of being able to recognize something. We're very, very good at that. And if you think about, you know, our evolutionary past has to do with uh, standing there on the savanna and is that a great big saber tooth tiger over there or is it an antelope? You know, we have that ability. And even people with, uh, you know, like me, we still see it. We still recognize there's something there. Um, people with perfect vision just can see all the details. So we have about that. We, we, we understand that. But here's the part that to me is amazing. So when we get this stuff, either through ears or eyes, we only can hang on to it for about seven seconds. In other words, it sits in the brain for about seven seconds, and then the brain tries to then do its thing, which I just read to you. It tries to organize it, filter it, make sense of it from prior knowledge. It starts to do all that within seven seconds of receiving it. And so as you can see, 
this cognitive load theory basically says you don't have a lot of time to get things straight. And then Mayer jumps in. He says, right, you don't. And if you don't follow these ideas, these principles, then nothing happens. Nor incomplete things happen. Let me read a little bit to you here from his book. Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning presents the idea that the brain does not interpret in multimedia presentations of words, pictures, and auditory information in a mutually explicit fashion. Rather, these elements are selected and organized dynamically to produce logical mental constructs. Remember, cognitive theory is based upon the idea of your senses taking in information and making logical sensory constructs. Furthermore, Mayer underscores the importance of learning based upon the testing of content and demonstrating the successful transfer of knowledge when new information is integrated with prior information. Now, I don't, you know, in other classes that I've taught, you know, we we kind of land on that whole prior knowledge bit, you know, about uh, if kids don't have understanding of prior knowledge, then there's no way in the world we can layer on another layer of knowledge. It's it's just who we are. Um, and that is that is bound up in constructivist theory. But, you know, as you can see here, it's also part of cognitive theory. What Mayer is is saying is that, all right, so you got this this seven second shot <laughs> at putting together sense out of what you present to people. So we see words and we hear words. We see pictures. We then start making sense of, well, what words and what pictures are helping me get the idea of whatever this person back here is talking about. Those sounds and those images then sort of go back and forth in our head, trying to make sense of it. And then we try to make sense of the organizing of the words. Do I know what this word is based upon something else I've already learned? Do I know what these pictures are based upon something I've already learned? And so we have this verbal mode and this pictorial mode that's going on in our head, in our working memory. Then it comes out as being put together. And then the last stop on the journey is it checks in with prior knowledge and then it goes into long-term memory man do you see all the ways that this can fail and that's what mayor is all about so what he tried to do was he tried to sit down and put together these 12 principles that basically define how you don't screw this up, <laughs> how you how this works. Now, take a step back for a second. Think about those very early books that you read to your children or you had read to you. And, and I mean early. I'm thinking like the hop on pop books. Hop, hop, hop on pop. And if you then looked at the picture, it was almost an exact duplicate of what the words were saying. Well, it was an exact duplicate of the words. And that's why they were such effective books. And that's why when little kids sit down and take their first stabs at reading, they'll go to a book like that because the words and the pictures make sense. Now, when we are reading to kids, remember when we are reading to kids, they're not only seeing it, but they're hearing it. And if there's any disconnect between here, here, and here, then it just falls flat on his face. What do I mean? So if you've got something on your projection screen and it's talking about specific words now, we're not talking about A's and A's and D's and so on. We're talking about specific words that have to do with what you're trying to teach. 
And when I hear those words and I see those words, if there is any disruption, if there is any talking that does not fit with this, in other words, what I hear, then this is what I call crossing the streams. <laughs> it just blows up. Now, same thing for pictures. If what I'm talking about up here does not fit with the picture that I'm looking at, you know, this starts, this starts to fall apart very rapidly. You see this all the time. And it's not bad teaching. It's just uninformed teaching because Mayer would stand back there and he would say, okay, remember, you were trying to explain um, trying to explain something. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. I, I did this last night and it was so embarrassing. It's you're trying to explain slope. And so you put up the picture of a slope run over rise. You then start talking about slope as run over rise. Okay. What does that mean? So if all my picture is of a stair step, then the words up here, I, I'm not making connections because run over rise, what does that mean? Now, if I have a picture of what run means and a picture of what rise means, and then the other thing that we do is we run off and we start talking about, if you look at something, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And so again, if this and this don't, connect it basically gets lost in here all right that's my review of mayor um now let's go ahead and do those wonderful wonderful uh principles mayor has 12 principles he started out with nine <laughs> I remember when I first taught this class and, and taught his book, um, he had these nine principles. And I remember I was so embarrassed because the next year I had, uh, I had the old, the old uh, edition and the new edition suddenly jumped to 12. So I had to do a little scrambling to get uh, understood what he was trying to do. It is, to me, I guess maybe because I've been doing it for so many years, it is just like rain. It just makes sense. Rain falls down. Rain always seeks the least path. Of resistance. I mean, it just makes sense. Um, and so what I've tried to give you here is here's some reading. And then I told you last week, whoops, told you last week that you need to watch this because this does one of the best jobs I've ever seen of explaining. Now, if you need something to help you get to sleep tonight, watch this. All I'll say. Um, let me throw up here on the screen this PDF. Here we go. So let's let me walk you through these. Now, what I'll do is I go through these. I will note what uh, principles I'm not going to allow you to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to allow you to do this for the assignment because uh, they're too sim they're too simple. I, I need you to do something to think. So let's start with number one, coherence. By the way, these are not in any rank order. There's no hierarchy here. In other words, this one's not the most important one, and this is the least important one, although I think this one down here is he basically was trying to come up with something or maybe one of his GAs, you know, one of his PhD students came up with it. I don't know. But so there's no rank order here, okay? Uh, and it's just basically you're looking at things. And basically what you do, it, when you really get serious about doing this, um, what you'll find is, is when you sit and watch somebody's visual multimedia presentations, it is a wave that comes at you. It's not, oh, look, there's the coherence principle. Oh, here comes the signaling principle. No, it's all just kind of coming at you at, at the same time. And so you have to kind of get these in your head if you want to get serious about watching uh, to see if this is going on. 
So let's go ahead and start number one, coherence principle. People learn better when extraneous words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included. Why is that the case? You now know. You only have a certain amount of time to hold things into your memory. Simple as that. And if you cross the streams, I keep using that term. If you keep, it's, it's my term, by the way. It's not a real term. If you keep crossing those streams where you will have the word and a picture, but then you go off on a tangent talking, you, you, you just lose people left and right. And how many times have you sat in a PowerPoint presentation, especially those you get back from the state about how did your kids score on the test? And then somebody goes wandering off, especially the presenter. And you know, you just sit there and go, I, what, huh? Signaling principle, you know this one. Good teachers know this one. People learn better when cues that highlight the organization, the essential material are added. I am going, we are going to be talking about Newton's three laws of motion. Law number one. Text, picture. Next, we're going to talk about law. You know, you know this as good teachers. You know how to do that. So in presentations, people need to know what's coming at them. They need to know where it's coming or when it's coming. Redundancy principle. People learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and on-screen text. What? That flies against everything that the textbook people uh, who provide you with those great PowerPoints to go along with the textbooks would have you believe. Let me read that one again. People learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and on-screen text. How about that? Now, this one really confuses folks and they get really mad at me about it because it's like, wait a minute, I got to have the words up there and I got to talk about the words and then I got to have a picture for them to go with it because you just said to me, all right, slow down. The text can be on the screen. Word. That's the graphic. You talk about that word. The next picture, video, is where you then talk me through how the word then applies or the idea. Yeah, text does not mean one word. I'm sorry if I, I'm if I'm making that and I'm wrong. It's not just one word. It can be a, you know, it can be a, a, a sentence, a phrase. But what he's saying here is if you put all three, you're overloading that sensory input thing sensory input thing. Listen to me. You're overloading, overloading your ability to receive information from both hearing and visual. And in this case, you're getting two hits on the visual. And then on top of that, you've got the narration going on. Okay, four and five, you're not allowed to use for the assignment. I'll explain them. They're stupidly simple. Spatial contiguity principle. People learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented near rather than far from each other on the page or the screen. Well, duh. Temporal contiguity. People learn better when corresponding words and pictures are presented simultaneously rather than successively. Well, duh. Okay. You know, again, I keep coming back to um, the best example of the presentations that follow Mayer's principles are the ones that uh, Apple does when they do their little, you know, shows. And if you watch an Apple presentation, two things you'll notice right away. Very large graphics, of course, they're trying to show off their product. But then you'll notice that they really do follow this idea about spatial and temporal contiguity. The word, the name, I watch, or iPhone is right there. Again, it's like a duh. Number six, you know this one because you're good teachers. Segmenting principle. People learn better from a multimedia lesson that is presented in a user paced segments rather than continuous unit. Um, hello? 
you know, this is what we do as good teachers. We call this chunking. We chunk the information so that it doesn't overwhelm our students. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying you don't just throw everything at somebody. Number seven, pre-training principle. People learn better from a multimedia lesson when they know, when they know, the names and characteristics of the main concepts. Hello. Hello. Again, just good teaching. Just good teaching. Before I ever put anything up on a screen, I've done my job. I've stood there and I said, okay, we are now going to be learning about this. And here are the here is the vocabulary you need to know for this. Then I can go to my multimedia presentation and then I can see to the kids, okay, look for those words. Look for these eyes. This one, number eight, is again, it's kind of a, a reflection of three. Three and eight, I think, ought to be just put together. But modality principle, I get what he's trying to do here. People learn better from graphics and narration than from animation and on screen text. What? What? People learn better from graphics and narration from animation and on screen text. Let's sink in for a sec. So if I'm looking at a picture on a screen and you are either A, talking to me about it, in other words, in real time, or B, there is narration that goes along with the picture. Then it does animation and on-screen text. In other words, brain, your brain's, he's talking about your modalities here, your senses your ability to hear and see that's what throws people is that word what he's trying to say here is you get it better if you can see graphics and narration in other words i'm explaining it to you then an animation has text that goes with it without any narration get it because if you add the narration into the animation and the on-screen text boom you're right back to redundancy principle and you cross the streams and your brain goes poof. Multimedia principle. People learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. Well, duh. That's another one you use. So, so far, four, five, nine, if you're keeping score at home. Four, five, and nine, you're not allowed to use as the assignment. I mean, I'm giving this one to you guys because normally what we do when we have small numbers in this class, um, is we basically just say, hey, go ahead and do all of these. Huh. You know, I think you, you get it, that you'll, you'll be able to do a nice job. Personalization principle. This is, this is, a, these next three are all new. Okay. And the original principles of Mayor, it stopped right here, multimedia. And I'll come back to nine in just a second, kind of wrap this up. Personalization principle. People learn better from multimedia lessons when words are in con conversational style rather than informal style well yeah and again and again i go back to those god-awful powerpoint presentations that you sit through as a teacher where somebody tries to act like you know this is um the ten commandments that have come down from on high and they'll gussy gussy it all up with this heavy heavy formal language bum ba bum ba bum Again, when you're teaching science, you know this, you know this better than anybody. When you're teaching science, you're trying to make all of that heavy vocabulary, bring it to kids so that they could understand it. And you do that in a conversational style. You don't sit there and lecture. You try to get kids to help them understand connections. That's all it means. Voice principle. People learn better when narration in multimedia lessons is spoken in a friendly human voice rather than a machine voice. Can't you see that one? Can't you see that when somebody ran into his office one day and said, hey, what do you think about this idea about these computers talking to people? Can you say, Alexa? Did you hear it go off? I've got one sitting right next to the computer here in the studio. Hey, Alexa. 
Do you speak in a human voice? Sorry, I don't know that one. Yeah. I bet you that's where that came from. Number 12, image principle. People do not necessarily learn better from a multimedia lesson when the speaker's image is added to the screen. <laughs> I'm laughing because one of the things that when um, when I teach the 587 class that I always find funny is when you look at examples of people who are doing um, online trainings or online teaching, they have this bad habit of putting their face up in the upper left, up to right, down left, down right corners. I don't need to see you. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything in terms of helping me understand. And then, of course, we know now that it's a violation of redundancy principle. Hello. Hello. It's also a violation of modality principle. Hello. So there they are. Those are the 12 principles of mayor. So let's repeat. You're not allowed to use four and five. Um, I'm going to let, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you back nine. So no four and five, you may use nine. And you and I'll let you keep 10, 11, 12, because they're funny. But let me, let me go back to why nine is so important. It's funny because he just says that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. In his book, this goes on for pages. <laughs> and here's what he, remember, he is a cognitive science, he's a cognitive psychologist. He's not an educator. Um, he's kind he reminds me in, in a way of David Rose, the guy I talked to you about when I talked to you about universal design for learning. Dr. Rose is a neurologist and he got invested in being able to look at people's brain signatures through all the MRI work that suddenly was, you know, we were able to do. And he discovered how people's brains light up in different parts. Well, anyway. But so he's a lot like that in the sense that he's not really, you know, he can't sit down and say, let's look at the things that you teach with because it's not his turf. But under multimedia principle in the book, he writes very eloquently and I think very simply about this. He says, so here's, here's what our research has shown. I'm going to go back. All right. Here's, here's what Mayer's multimedia number nine is all about. And it, and I, and it goes to show you how he, he really did a nice job here. Uh, just kind of sticking to that. This is all of these are important. None is any more important than the other, although I would argue maybe image, you know, <laughs> really, come on. Um, but nine is, I think, the core. And here's what he says. So we have this process of looking at pictures and words. We now understand how that all works. We now understand that if we do multiples of either one, in other words, words that do not work together, either through narration or seeing them, we now understand why that doesn't work together. You only have limited capacity to hold this stuff. And by the way, that's for everybody. You know, you can be the smartest person in the room, but sorry. And then, you know, when you, when you toss in pictures, and then it's kind of like, wait a minute, you said modality says people learn better from pictures, uh, graphics, and narration than animation and on-screen text. What he's really saying there is when you do animation and on-screen text and you're talking, kaboom, you've crossed the stream. Now, here's what multimedia goes on to say that he doesn't put here in his principle. And I think this is... This speaks volumes to how we teach. And that's all the way down here. So in Mayer's research, what he found was people who had strong prior knowledge, experiential knowledge. You've heard me say this example how many times? Somebody read to you. Somebody took you places. Somebody talked to you. 
you have prior knowledge, you have a library of understandings. When Mayer took his multimedia cognitive theory, 12 principles, so on and so on, and he looked at how it then affected people. In other words, following all these 12 principles and understanding the cognitive theory multimedia, people learn better. Do you know what he found? It didn't make a whit of difference with people who have strong prior knowledge. You could put up the worst multimedia presentation you could think of. And people with strong prior knowledge, lots of, lots of connections, lots of practice at making connections. I mean, that's what we're trying to do with teaching, isn't it? We're trying to get kids to see the connections, how things hang together. And when you have that kind of person, they can respond in a way that they kind of cherry pick what's in whatever's being presented to them, if it's good or bad. But here's where his research really focused in on. People who do not have a multitude of prior knowledge, experiential knowledge, if we adhere to this cognitive theory of multimedia learning, if we pay homage to the 12 multimedia principles, they will learn. Isn't that great? Um, and, and to me, this is, this is why I, I think the world of Mayer, because it opened my eyes to one of the things about how we use multimedia. You know, we, we put stuff on a, on, you know, we all have computers now and projectors. So we have this amazing amount of information we can show kids. And if we don't pay attention to the very simple, very beginnings here, that narration that is not locked like a laser on whatever the vocabulary is that we are showing, and then if the pictures are not locked like a laser on what it is that we're talking about, this part of our brain basically goes, don't get it. And then it tries to make more sense of it, and it just gets further and further and further out of whack. But people who sit there who have lots and lots of prior knowledges, lots and lots of connections, at this point where things kind of go wacky, they have the ability in that working memory to be able to say, well, wait a minute, that's like this. I remember, I remember Miss Gupton talked about that last week, so it's like this. It plugs in this way. The kid who doesn't have that capability or who doesn't have that marvelous library that gives him the comfort level, it all falls apart. Okay. So I think I have given you enough. As I've said, uh, it doesn't get any better right here. So watch that. And if you want to text me and say, hey, hey, you got number nine all wrong. Well, okay. <laughs> but let's all agree, four and five are off the table. We're not going to allow you to do those because they're too simple. And let me go back then and let's talk about a voice thread. What are voice threads? Well, voice threads have been around for a while. I started using voice threads back when I was running instructional technology um, inside of JCPS. And I love it. I still think it's a good product. Uh, a lot of my colleagues hate it, but I, I don't understand why. Because one of the things about it is if you do a good voice thread, you can very easily point to Mayor and say, hey, that's Mayor. Mayor's running in this thing. So let's go, let me show you how it works. So here's Mayor's principal voice thread assignment. So I'm going to click on that. That launches an LTI, and then it takes you in here. And it says, hey, there's no voice threads here. You want to make one? Sure. So you can't see it on my screen. Let me see if I can move things over enough that you can see it. Yeah, there it is. So up here in the upper right, it says add your own. Notice. Uh, that 
what I do when I set this up is I basically, you know, give it a, a course. So this is like a big folder. If you think about it. Uh, then down here, this is where you can see the order of things and so on and so on. Okay. That's all it's for. Now we're going to go and add our own. So we're going to create a new voice thread. And boom, here we are. So, <laughs> so what you have to do is you can either, and let's, let me show you what I mean. So I can add media. Now I can add media from a, a quite a uh, variety of sources. So I can pull in things from my computer. What the reason why I went with VoiceThread when I first started teaching Mayor is it's very easy to bring in a PowerPoint. Hello. Very easy to bring in a PowerPoint or a slides. Okay. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about the uh, Apple version. I'm, I'm not sure, so I'm not going to say that. I know slides and, and PowerPoints come in just fine. So if I do that, I go to my computer. Um, hey, look, he had a PowerPoint here. And I'm going to drop it in. And as you can see, one of the things I love about voice threads is you can't screw one of these up. Because right away, it's saying things to you, hey, uh, would you like to give it a title, etc.? So I know what to do with it. Under playback options, you can, if we were really doing this with kids and we were going to use this with kids, I'd land on here and I'd talk to you. Because one of the best things about it is this one right here is enabling threaded commenting. Um, this allows people to talk to each other about what they see. The power of VoiceThread is it's conversations that happen away from the classroom. Um, and so what you're allowed to do, you can have people see the presentation. You then request them to give you feedback. And then I can go in and I can see what uh, Madeline said and leave her feedback. And then Carrie can come in and she can either leave feedback for Madeline as well, or she can look at my feedback and she can leave feedback on my feedback. Kind of cool. Here are the allowed ways that you can uh, do it. One of the things that they changed over the years is they used to not do this one. You used to not have text. So it was always had to be spoken. And they got enough pushback from people who said, you can't do that. You know, there are people out there who that's their way of, of demonstrating learning as their writers. So they came in, they had this sort of Twitter kind of uh, ability to write just a few words, a few characters. I think in the original or in the, in the version where they allowed this, it was very Twitter-ish. It was like 140 characters, something like that. Now it's everything. You could write your whole dissertation inside of a voice thread if you wanted to. Uh, these others are basically, would you allow people to add slides? Um, we used to do really fun stuff with groups of kids, and we would say, okay, you five, you own this. And then they could work on it, uh, put themselves in together, and then they could do all kinds of cool things. I really, a lot of people think of things have gone past voice thread and it really is past its prime. I don't know. I still like it. So here you are. So here's a, a, a PowerPoint that I made uh, for the class. I think that Madeline is in right now. Um, and I, what I want to do is I want to get to, well, we'll go back and look at it. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Move things around. See, ding, ding. You can, if you click on the pencil, you can go in and you can do a citation. You can do a comment. You can do a caption. That's the word I was looking for. Okay. But where you really, 
want to look at is click on the slide. And then up here where it says comment. So let me get you that again. So you're going to go through, and if this is my opening slide, I click on it, I come up here to comment, and then this is where it shows up. So down here, here's the graphic. Down here, there's a little plus sign. When I click on that plus sign, it gives me this rainbow, I call it the rainbow arc, of all the different ways that you can now comment. Your job is to comment via voice you cannot use text sorry it always cracks me up the number of times teachers say they hate hearing their voice well okay it happens to be your main tool of communication so you're going to use your voice and you're going to communicate allow my microphone to work with it this is my demonstration uh, presentation on professional learning networks i stop the recording it uploads it If I like it, I save it. If I don't like it, I cancel it. Simple as that. Okay. Now, I can just click on the, I can go back and just go to the next slide. Do the same thing. Comment. Come down here. Click on the little microphone and talk. If I want to, I can zoom in on things. So, if what I've got here, my graphic, this is very mayor. If, if my graphic is really important, I can zoom in on it, see? And then I can hit my plus sign and I can talk about it. Very mayor. Um, then also down here, I can just work my way through. In other words, I can go to the next slide, hit the button, start commenting. One of the things that you get in, in the world of uh, VoiceThread, and there really is a world out there. I mean, there are people who... I'm a voice thread certified teacher, whatever the heck that means. Um, there are people who are like that. And there's a lot of argument about should the narration be just on the screen for each slide? In other words, talk, 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 save it, move to the next slide. Or should it be Talk, 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 go to the next slide. Talk, 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 go to the next slide. Talk, 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 go to the next slide. Now stop. Because what it'll do, let's So your formative assessment for the evening is what, what mayor principle did I just demonstrate? <laughs> Maybe voice principle. Okay, I hope you're getting the idea. It's very straightforward, very simple to do. Now, what do you do when you get finished? So you've gone through and you've done all this great work. And I'm going to cancel that. Thanks. You've gone through and you've done all this great work. So what you want to do now is you've got to get it out of here and get it into your assignment. There's a couple of ways to do it. I'll show you what I think is the easiest way. You come over here and you click on that. And then you come down here where it says export. Now, one of the things that I love about it is that it will do an embed. In other words, you can actually pick it up and drop it somewhere. So if you had, for example, if you had a Google Sites uh, that is connected to your Google Classroom, you could create a uh, voice thread and put it in there and you know people can see it or if you go to export you can go in and you can do a basic um, that and so from basic you see I can copy the link allow anyone to view and comment now by the way the allow anyone to view and comment what that allows for then is uh, people who are within the VoiceThread community. So here at U of L, we're, you know, like I said, a VoiceThread. I'm kind of proud of the fact that I actually talked them into buying this. 
Um, we are a voice thread community. So that means that anybody who's got a Ulink account that can see your voice thread could comment on it. I wish I could convince the state to do the same thing so that we can make this a part of all learning out there. Um, certainly would help with digital backpacks, if you ask my humble opinion. For us, all we have to do is copy the link. Boom. Now let's go back and actually actually look at the assignment so I make sure that I'm telling you how to do it right. So what did Steve want? He wants you to make a voice thread based upon one of the uh, principles. And I kind of talked to you about what they are. They can be images, documents, videos. Oh, I'll go back and show you how you can put a video in. So this is just all about, you know, voice. This is the sales pitch on voice thread. Don't worry about, you know, you got to comment. Five, don't worry about any of that. Your voice thread will be divided into six sections. Can you say six slides? Title slide with the principal and your name on it. Define the principal. This is what it means, Steve. In your words, please. Thank you. You know, I mean, coherence principle. People learn better when extraneous words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included. In my own words, that would mean don't do a presentation where you have too many distractions. How about that? Example, the principle in your own words. You may not, oh, this is because we used to use the book, so you can ignore that. So what I want you to do is just example the principle in your own words. What do you think it means? The case for the principle. Why is it important to learning to learning for multimedia? Again, once in your own words. You will get this. You'll get these. One, two, three. One, two, excuse me. Um, you'll get that from... Uh, the video that I was, I keep saying, watch that, watch that. It does a marvelous job with these two. Create a word cloud. Do you know how to do word clouds? I guess I better show you. Create a word cloud from the cliff notes to identify the major concept of your principal, and then make that a slide, a prompt question for us to respond after your principal. So let's do that. Let's go through that real fast just so you can see it. Do not embed, just use the link. It's, you know, if you want to try the embed, and I'm, I can show you. I'll show you how to embed it. Let's just, just do all this. So first of all, I'm going to make that word cloud thing that Steve told me I had to make. So I'm going to go in here, and he said go to the Cliff Notes version. What is that? What is the Cliff Notes version? Well, now I feel bad because it looks like I don't have it here. I have it here. Yeah, here it is. It was what we were just looking at. Okay, so I'm going to do coherence principle. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to highlight just these words. That's all. And I'm going to copy them. Now, I'm going to go back to... Uh, where Steve has the assignment. There's a lot of jumping around here, and I apologize. And I'm now going to go to uh, the actual top level here. So let's go all the way up to here. And go back, go back, whoops, hit the wrong one. Go back into modules and go to here. And then he's got this thing in here called ABC. -ya. It's a word cloud creator. Very simple to use. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click there. Word clouds, start. Paste in what I just copied. Ta-da. That's all. Now, what I want to do is now I want to be able to create. So, bam. There it is. So what's kind of interesting, the reason for the uh, reason for word clouds, they were really, really hot there for, I don't know, five, six years ago. 
the whole point of them is is that the most important word is the largest word. And when I look at this, <laughs> looks like they're all important words, which is fine. Not a problem. What do we do with it? Oh, by the way, at this point, you can change the layout if you don't like the way that looks. You can go there. You can go there. You can change the words. You can change the colors. You can change the font. Okay. You can say how many words are you going to allow. Well, you know. Now, I'm going to save this menu. I'm going to save to my desktop. And I got to get to my desktop. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to call it Steve's Words Cloud. That's all. And then I will save it. Okie doke. Now let's jump back into our wonderful voice thread. So I hope what you're gathering from this is you're going to do all this stuff ahead of time. <laughs> okay. If you try to do this while you've got the voice thread running and everything, you'll just drive yourself nuts. So go ahead, decide on your principle, watch the video, make notes, get your narration, get all that together, then go off, open up, you know, your presentation of choice, tool of choice, and start putting together the pieces. That's top. Oh, it's, it's waiting for me to do that again because I didn't save it, by the way. Bam. So there's my first one. Okay. Click, comment, you know. When we look at what the word cloud shows us, it's really interesting because basically what it's saying here is all the words that have to do with the coherence principle actually have the same amount of weight and meaning. Stop. Uploading. Okay. That's it. Now, let me, while well, I'm, make sure that we get it, because I, I don't want you to not understand. One of the things you can do is you can go in and add media. Let, let me make sure I'm right about this media sources. And Flickr, Google Drive. Oh, there you go, Carrie. There's your Google Drive. So, yeah, I thought they had changed this to allow you to put in. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me let me make sure about this. Because there's something in my brain, noodling around in my brain, that says that you can add a um, YouTube video and it will work. So what I'm going to do real fast, gang, is I'm going to go up here and I'm going to go to YouTube -y and let's grab the first one we see. This is a really good, this guy does a really nice job, by the way. Um, come on. Hi, Tyler. Thanks for all that. All right, so let's go back in. Now, this is what I thought they said it could now do. Let's see if it does. So it's processing. It's processing. That's good. At this point, if it couldn't handle uh, bringing this YouTube video into this via the URL, that's what I use. Let me show you again. So I went here and I came down to where it just says URL. Now, the other cool thing about this is an URL to something else works as well. So let me go back. Let's see. Um, I guess I could just use that one. Yeah, let's use that one. So there's the URL to our... PDF, 
about the principles. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. I'm going to put in Earl. Well, that's a big old Earl, too. And I'll drop that in. Let's see what it does. So this is this is what people complain about VoiceThread. There it is. Popped right in. People complain about VoiceThread is they say it takes forever for it to handle the multimedia video part. And as you can see, it does. Um, when you create your little how many slides? Six? So when you create your little six slide PowerPoint or slides presentation, remember, I'm not so sure about Keynote, um, it will pop right in. You saw how fast that one that I did has a lot of slides, how fast it did it. But it does take a while for it to process the video. Okay. Um, if you share and return to course, I didn't do this with my original one. Last thing, share and return to course. And you can see it says, I'm going to submit it to the 690. There it is. There's your voice thread in our course. Now, what do we say? Well, Steve said I could uh, do all kinds of cool things with it. Yep, you can. So I'm going to click on the export thing. And I'm going to click on export. No, I meant basic. I'm sorry. Basic. And I can copy the link and I can put that over into my wiki. Now, let's try, though, and see what would happen if we copied the embed code. So now I'm going to jump out of here and we're going to go to PBWorks. Good old PBWorks. And I'm going to log in to my PBWorks uh, wonderful database or wikis. Uh, let's see, I've been playing around cleaning this one up. Right. Okay. First thing we need to know is we have to turn on the edit so things will work. We are going to get down to where we want this to end up, our voice thread. And we are going to go to insert. We are going to go to HTML JavaScript. We are now going to paste in here our voice thread embeddable code we're going to go next and if this comes in we're in pretty good shape i'm going to insert the plug in i will come down here to save dun, 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 dun. there it is so it still works that's good to see um and then as you can see when i click on it it basically starts the presentation and as you can see i gave by default it gives you the ability to have your person click through the presentation on their own boy it still hadn't brought in that video <laughs> it must be a really long video and then i'm going to go here okay so there you are and then of course what you're putting into the assignment is that you're going up here and you're getting the Earl of the page in your wiki where this voice thread lives. Let's see if I can get us back. And we'll wrap this up. We went back and talked about Mayor because this is what it's all about. And we talked about his cognitive theory of multimedia and how it's based upon, based upon cognitive theory. Um, cognitive, cognitivism, cognitivism. And it is basically the idea that your senses act on information that they then make meaning from. And then that then passes into your short term memory. And then it passes, if it can be made meaning from, passes on to your long term memory. Uh, and especially it will stay in long term memory if you have prior knowledge that makes sense to the new knowledge. Mayor pops in and he says, Well, so this is how I see that 
beginning to work with multimedia. And he then goes on to tell us his 12 principles of multimedia. Simple as that. We now can know that Steve has ruled out spatial and temporal contiguity because they're too silly and easy to know. He is going to let you, I can't stress enough, You know what I mean? It's good stuff. Watch that multimedia presentation <laughs> and you'll see how it all fits together. Okay, this is the last of our lift. This is the hardest part of the whole course right here. Um, once we get past this, the fun starts. Uh, everything else on out is basically uh, wonderful tools that allow you to create multimedia creations. Next week, we will jump into using an Animoto. Um, any of these that have a pay paywall to them, I gladly share you share with you my username and password. So if you want to use them with your kids, Animoto, we will use it to create a story of our journey into teaching. The power of the Animoto is, the challenge of the Animoto is, you can use words, but they're not spoken words. Um, what it basically is creating music and picture presentations. Now, the beauty of it is, is that it uses copyright royalty free music. So you can use some really nice music. And we'll talk about if you want to use your own music. Uh, actually, you're allowed to under certain very important rules. Then we will jump into digital storytelling. Uh, and we will jump into my favorite right here, creating an audio story. This is where kind of I land. Uh, in fact, uh, just this last week, I had a online through the Google handouts teaching people how to use, uh, how to create a podcast. So uh, that one's a biggie for me. But next week, we'll just do this one. Animoto. Lots of fun. Everything from here on out is easy. Okay. As always, if you have problems, concerns, what the heck did you mean this time, Steve? You can text me at 502-457-2937, um, and I will get right back to you. And together, together, we will fill it out, or we will find out, excuse me, we will find an answer. As always, a joy, a joy being with you.